Well, thank you, uh, Stephen, and thanks to uh, Carrie Kessler, whose role in this process has already been acknowledged. She's going to keep us on track this morning for those of us who are less than competent about um, the audiovisual side of, of life. Um, let me just say at the outset, well, one thing I'll say at the outset is please silence these things. I actually just learned with the assistance of a colleague how to mute my brand new phone this morning, so uh, thanks for that. And thanks also particularly to ULI for um, allowing uh, us at the Public Law Center to co-sponsor this event um, with them. It's taken an awful lot of work by um, staff such as Carrie and volunteers uh, who populate the ranks of ULI, and we're delighted that um, those of you who've come out this morning are going to join us for this event. CBAs are a new process in Louisiana, and in New Orleans particularly. We've tried them before, but um, we've not gotten across the finish line. So this is really intended to be an introduction, a rollout of CBAs in this community. Um, there are a number of materials that we would encourage you to take advantage of on a table out back. Um, you'll find there, if you haven't already, a, a long form agenda, which takes you through this morning's activities. And on the back are the biographies of our brief bios of our three speakers from Wilmington, Delaware. We are going to build the morning program around a case study of how a community benefit agreement evolved in Wilmington and what a difference it made from the perspectives of the community representative, Marvin Thomas, who's joined us here, the developer, Nelson Wydell, and the district council member, Hanifa Shabazz. After we've heard their presentations, we'll hear responses from Bill Gilchrist with the city and with Keisha Brown Robinson with the Central City Renaissance Alliance. So um, with those sort of preliminary comments, let me move to the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, and one other item. If law professors never mentioned their law review articles, no one would read them. So there's a copy out back of an article from the Urban Lawyer a few years ago about Community Benefit Agreement's new vehicle for investment in America's neighborhood. I won't tell you who wrote it, but pick up a copy. <laughs> All right, CBA overview, what they are and what they aren't. I think it's important to get both sides of that equation. A lot of people have a sense of what they think CBAs are. I think perhaps some of my comments this morning will um, disabuse some of those notions. So starting with what are they? Very simple and straightforward. A CBA is an enforceable contract directly negotiated between a developer and a community benefits coalition. How do you know if you have a CBA? It's real simple. You have to have a signed and enforceable agreement between a developer and a community benefits coalition. If you don't have that agreement, you don't have a CBA. So there are a lot of things out there that might lead people to think, oh, well, that's a CBA or a CBA process that I would suggest may not be entirely accurate. Let's look at some other um, agreements that we're familiar with, and starting with the um, public-private partnership agreement. Here's a diagram of how PPPs compare with CBAs, and what you see is a straight line of negotiation between a developer and on the left of the triangle, the city. And that's what yields up a private-public partnership, or PPP. It's a two-way negotiation between the developer and the city. And in most instances, that process doesn't invite public participation until rather late along. Frequently, it's when the 267-page document gets dropped on the desk of the city council, and we're all invited to come to a hearing on it. You're not going to have much impact on that finely negotiated document at that point. But for better or for worse, that's what a PPP, where it comes from, a direct negotiation between the city and a developer. A community benefits agreement, on the other hand, is a direct negotiation between the developer and a community benefits coalition, or CBC. And what it leads to is an enforceable agreement signed by both parties. So what do economic development projects need 
in order to succeed. Frequently, they need public benefits or subsidies, which might come in the form of zoning approvals, favorable financing, and infrastructure improvements. Those elements of public approval are the leverage that fuels, frequently, the community benefit process. If you've got a project that doesn't need any approval from the public sector, you could still theoretically do a community benefits agreement, but a lot of the juice that fuels that process would have been removed from the system. Because to get approval for these public benefits, project developers often need public or community support. One CBA advocate um, said the following about the rationale for CBAs. If public money is used to subsidize private development, then the developer has to guarantee community benefits like good jobs, affordable housing, child care, all the things that communities need. Now that's a fairly provocative comment. The developer has to guarantee. So I think in all fairness, we have to ask next, what does the developer get out of this process? And here are some examples. The um, Community Benefits Coalition agrees to support the project with public testimony and written statements. Properly composed, the CBC should represent all of the different stakeholder interests in a community, and it needs to function transparently. If it speaks with authority for that broad neighborhood representation, then it can do a lot to reduce risk when the developer goes before the favorable tax financing public body or the council for zoning approvals and the city planning commission. Having the neighborhood shoulder to shoulder with a developer reduces the risk considerably and that represents value for developers. Developers get value out of community benefit agreements. It's not a one-way bestowal of favor on the community. So reducing or eliminating risk is worth something to developers and that value is reflected in the community benefits agreement. So this CBC, our community benefit coalition, negotiates for community benefits. That's in bold because it's meant to emphasize that these are benefits for the entire community. And there is an important ethical precept to be recognized here, and that's represented in the second bullet point. No member of the CBC negotiating team may receive a direct benefit from the CBA. You know, you might want to create a child care center in Kingsley House so that people working in a project nearby would know that they had a safe place to drop their children while they went to work. And Kingsley House would probably be a great operator of a child care center. And Kingsley House might be a part of the Community Benefits Coalition that has come together to try to win benefits for the community. But it would be inappropriate for Kingsley House to sit as a member of the negotiating team dealing directly with a developer. So there are certain lines that need to be drawn in order to protect the integrity of this process. Transparency, the third bullet point, is another huge guarantee of integrity. You know, uh, there is in the literature something called the graft problem, and it rears its head unhappily on occasion as the individual in a community or even a group that says to a developer, you know, you're not going to have much success in our neighborhood if we're not given a contract or put on the payroll to help you bring that process to completion. What's bad about that particular discussion is that it takes place off the radar screen. And nobody other than the party um, holding out the hand for benefit really derives much public value from it. You know, the developer can't announce that I've just given over a substantial sum of money as a result of this sub rosa discussion. But on the other hand, in a community benefits coalition process where the negotiation is above board and publicly acknowledged, the developer can say at the end of the process, and here's what we have done to strengthen the community into which our project is going to go. So um, transparency is an extremely important component of this whole process. 
We have on the website of the Public Law Center a number of materials that um, would assist community groups and inform others with regard to the CBA process, and you've got um, references to that on some of the materials. We'd certainly encourage you to, to consult it. Okay, so what types of benefits have CBAs provided to communities? Local and minority hiring commitment. You know, hire from the neighborhood so that the living wage and benefits will go into the hands and the pocketbooks of people who live near the project and who presumably will use those dollars to support small businesses in the vicinity. Um, educational partnerships between developers and community schools. You want to talk about workforce development and building capacity? You know, it would be great for the project to say to high school students, stay in there, get that high school degree, and we will favor you with, you know, benefits in the employment track or to run an apprentice program where students from the local high school can come and be part of the development in their neighborhood. Um, physical improvements like open space, parks, and playgrounds, frequently developments take out of commerce areas that are used by children in the neighborhood for casual play. Wouldn't it be fair to put back something in the way of an organized playground as a part of this whole developmental process? And affordable housing and rehabilitation, senior centers and child care facilities, what benefits are right for a particular neighborhood ought to be driven from the ground up. It should be the neighborhood that says these are the things that we need in order to make our neighborhood stronger and our quality of life better. So what's the economic impact of a local hiring commitment? Well, conservatively, salaries turn over three times. That means that if people in the neighborhood are patronizing businesses in the neighborhood, they're going to be building small business and strengthening the neighborhood even further. And look at this third point. Both developers and neighbors benefit from stronger neighborhoods where expensive investments are located. I would suggest to you that developers have a shared interest with the community surrounding them in building a stronger neighborhood. You don't want your expensive investment to be in an area of declining value and rife with problems. Now, we've talked a lot about what CBAs are. Let's take on several items about what CBAs are not. They are not the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard. Interests that are unalterably opposed to a project will not join or sign a CBA. Their overriding goal is to kill the project. So, you know, NIMBY exists somewhere over here and CBAs exist somewhere over there. They are two different worlds. They are not on the same radar screen. You know, one of them helps a developer get a project done. The other is out to oppose it to the death. So CBAs are not an answer to NIMBY. What they, CBAs do is they facilitate development and benefits for the community. So that is why it is a win-win for both the developer and the community. CBAs are not new taxes, nor are they the flip side of that coin, tax breaks. You know, we frequently hear that additional tax revenues will be devised from new developments, and that's entirely accurate. And those tax revenues are going to bring benefits to the larger community, but that is not the benefit associated with CBAs that are negotiated by a community benefits coalition. Nor are the tax breaks that developers frequently look for um, a product of the CBA process. You know, tax breaks are negotiated in the public-private partnership, not in the community benefit agreement. So CBCs have no power to grant tax benefits. Um, they are not the um, uh, source of the new tax revenues. Um, CBAs are the private agreement between a developer and a community coalition, right where we started from. Another thing that CBAs are not is they are not a substitute for a citizen participation plan or a neighborhood participation plan. You know, over the next six months, we are going to have a very vigorous, very appropriate, very important discussion in New Orleans about a structured, formal, 
participation process and what it ought to look like. And that will yield up something that might variously be described as a CPP or citizen participation plan or an NPP neighborhood participation plan. Neither one of those is a CBA process. You can have CBAs in the absence of a formal structured citizen participation process. And conversely, you can have a CPP or an NPP, but not necessarily CBAs. So these items are very worthy items for discussion. They um, certainly um, might deserve a symposium of their own. And Stephen, as the um, ULI Crossreach Committee moves on to other possible topics, this is one that at least ought to be on the uh, agenda for discussion. Finally, CBAs are not inward looking. They are focused outward on benefits. Now, what do I mean by that? We have always traditionally had negotiations between developers and community members, and they traditionally focus inward on the physical and operational aspects of the project. They might, for example, be bargaining over lighting that doesn't shine out into the neighborhood but is rather focused into the project, or landscaping to screen parking areas. CBAs have an external focus. They're looking out to the surrounding community but beyond the confines of the project itself and asking what can we do to make a stronger and more sustainable neighborhood, positive contributions to the area outside of the project's boundaries. And CBAs allow neighborhood residents to represent themselves. They do not need to rely on government to protect their interests. So how can city and state government support CBAs? Well, first and foremost, perhaps most important, inform community coalitions of proposed developments. Early notice is like gold in this process. The sooner that people who live in a neighborhood know about something that's coming down the pike, the better able they will be to represent their interests in what would hopefully be a collaborative and harmonious dialogue with the public sector officials and with the private sector developer. Um, the public sector can encourage developers to enter into good faith negotiations with a responsible community coalition. The public sector can respect that negotiating process and honor the community coalition's agreement. And in some instances, it can fold the CBA into the public-private partnership agreement, which will allow for improved enforcement opportunities. So there are a lot of things that the public sector can do to support CBAs, but they probably shouldn't run the process. The process, I think, ought to be run by the Community Benefits Coalition and the developer. Why should we support CBAs? Well, let's start with equity. It is only fair that neighborhood residents affected by a project enjoy some benefits from its presence in their area. Those projects certainly frequently exert stress on neighborhoods. Um, lest this sound like a soft-hearted, soft-headed observation, let me connect the dots between the developer's interest in having a strong neighborhood surrounding the developer's investment. Now, this is not Im immune to benefit for the developer as well. It is also fair. Economic development, increased earnings by area residents roll over into the support of local small business, and that is part of economic development, not just the arrival of the new business. And then functionality, it works better when parties are on the same page. You know, building support with a CBA reduces risk. Um, it just makes sense for everyone, developer and community alike. So how do you define economic development. We'd probably get broad support in the room that recruiting new businesses is a wonderful feature of economic development, and that is unquestionably true. But it also means supporting local small businesses, keeping what you've got. And it also means one way you can do that is to pay living wages and benefits to people who live in the vicinity and who will go out and spend those dollars in their community. We've talked a bit about giving a hiring preference to high school graduates to build workforce development into the CBA system, and we've talked about sustaining stable neighborhoods. So 
In post-Katrina New Orleans, we need to consider all options to rebuild our economy and our community. CBAs are a new solution. We shouldn't look to government to solve problems on its own. We and government have to put the private sector resources at the center of recovery. CBAs create a partnership among the public, the private sector, and community resources. And again, collaborative process is a distinct improvement over adversarial process. Um, finally, the, um, the benefits of community benefit agreements. Well, they reduce risk for developers. Risk goes down if you've got a CBA. They um, encourage local economic development. That goes up because local hiring supports local small businesses. Peace and harmony go up. Creating a partnership among developers, city government, and community groups is a good step with value to all three communities. Um, strong and sustainable neighborhoods go up. So um, this is the 32,000-foot um, view of CBAs. What we'd like to move to next is more of a ground-level perception of how CBAs work in practice. And for that, we have recruited our three speakers from Wilmington. Um, I'm going to save a more detailed introduction for each one as they come up. But um, if you look on the back of your uh, long form agenda, um, you will see um, that uh, Marvin Thomas is our representative of the neighborhood organization. Nelson Wydell was the developer. Hanifa Shabazz is the district council member. So Kerry has loaded uh, Marvin's PowerPoint, so um, I'm going to invite him to come up here. Marvin is recently retired with 30 years of state government service. He is the president of the Southbridge Civic <coughs> Association, and in that capacity, he has worked with residents of the community and with city, state, and federal governments to develop a special area management plan to revitalize South Wilmington. Um, and interestingly, for the past 30 years, uh, Marvin has owned and operated a retail business in the city, so he brings to the uh, lectern not only a, uh, an understanding of what communities want, but also of what businesses need to uh, function. Marvin Thomas. And that moves you forward. Yeah. And the other one back. Yes,